What we're going to look at um, the rest of the time is just a farmland market update. We're going to uh, look at land values using USDA NAS data primarily. I'll put a little bit of Kansas data in, but uh, um, two weeks from now, um, Robin is going to talk about uh, um, actual sales data. Um, this uh, data that I'm primarily going to use this uh, um, today is just looking at NAS values. And so essentially we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at the factors affecting land values. And then we'll give you a little bit of a way to uh, think about uh, um, land values, certainly the numerator and uh, Greg and Dan talked about the numerator. Um, in some respects, I think the dot denominator may be a bigger player in the near-term future. And this is going to look at things such as inflation, um, um, interest rates, and then also uh, the uh, riskiness of the agricultural sector. And so um, that's what we're going to cover. To give a little bit of background, these are the NAS numbers and uh, they're released every August. And uh, if you look at this, uh, Kansas is right in the center. And uh, last year, actually, Kansas had the highest uh, increase in land values in the country um, in terms of uh, there was an increase of 25 percent. In terms of Nebraska had 21, Missouri 12, Oklahoma 11, and uh, Colorado right at 10. And so you can end up uh, seeing kind of uh, what occurred in the last year. This information is also brought or broken out by cropland and pasture land. And over the last year, um, Kansas had a 24.5% increase in um, cropland, again, um, the uh, highest in the country. And uh, from a pasture land perspective, it was 23.3%, again, the highest in the country. And so um, the first thing that you can end up looking at on all of these graphs, and you do have the slides if you want to take a detailed look at them. And, and again, these are USDA NAS from their annual uh, um, farmland value publication. But uh, 2022, from 2021 to 2022, there was a very large increase in um, um, land values. Certainly part of that was just due to the record high income that uh, we saw in uh, 2021. Um, in, in terms of uh, Greg had some estimates with regards to what we might be looking for cash um, net farm income for 2022 and 2023. Um, some of the early numbers that uh, we're getting from our farm management uh, data um, from uh, 2022 is uh, um, indicative that Greg's numbers are probably going to be pretty close to uh, where some of the early numbers on uh, um, that are feeding into our database um, will will be, and and, and so uh, certainly what we're looking at in in 2023 will have uh, expectations, but. To just give you a picture over a period of time, and you can see just how big that increase was in uh, 21 to 22 in terms of a very steep incline. But uh, these are the actual nominal land values from uh, 1950 to uh, 2022. One of the things that we end up doing is we end up uh, um, calculating an annual growth rate. And if you look at land year on year since uh, 1950, it's been about five and a quarter percent. Um, again, the way that these cumulative average growth rates are calculated, it does force the number in 1950 and 19 or in 2022 um, to to be on the point, and then you can kind of see what's what's going on there. Um, again, we talk about the uh, um, 1970s, 1980s bubble, and you can kind of see from nominal perspective where they were, and uh, uh, certainly were um, much higher than that with regards to that. Um, the other way you can look at this, is which economists probably spend more time thinking about, is the inflation-adjusted land values, and so this takes out the inflation. Um, a couple things is that the uh, crisis in the 70s and 80s was, was much bigger, um, but it is important to, uh, to realize that the land values from an inflation 
expectation inflation adjusted number is uh, quite a bit higher in terms of uh, they're about a thousand dollars per acre higher than uh, what we saw in the uh, 1970s and in 1980s. We can also calculate a cumulative annual growth rate um, since uh, uh, 1950. And again, calculating that uh, average growth rate, um, you're looking at a 2% above inflation. In some respects, um, you're looking at a five and a quarter in, in Kansas um, from a nominal perspective, and you're looking at about a 2% above inflation um, year in, year out. And so um, the, the big thing is, is land typically is a very good investment from a long-term um, type perspective. One of the things I think that it is important to realize is that nominal land values can fall, inflation adjusted uh, values can fall. And what I've done is taken the individual um, land value changes over this uh, 70 year, 72 year period for Kansas. And looking at this, essentially, if you add up everything from zero to the left, land values in Kansas fall about one in five years. And so in some respects, it's it's a little bit more um, um, likely than I think a lot of times people think about. Um, but uh, again, over this 72 year period where we have data from, from USDA NAS, um, we do see land values in Kansas fall in about one in five years. We look at the inflation adjusted numbers and basically it's one in three years. And so what this says, two out of three years, land value increases will, um, be higher than inflation, and one out of three, they'll be lower than inflation. In both of these graphs, you can see that there's a lot of mass between the negative five and 10% uh, range. And so in some respects, um, land is kind of a um, plotter investment. If you would compare this to S&P investments, um, certainly that will end up uh, um, um, having a wider range. I ended up taking a look at these numbers just to see in terms of what's going on um, from a um, nationwide perspective. I picked 20 states. In terms of looking at this, you can see that Kansas um, for the 2022 USDA growth estimate was 25.4%. If we look at this from 1950, it's five and a quarter. If you look at the real growth since 1950, it's 2%. Um, then I basically said, okay, let's uh, throw out the first 20 years and see what ha has happened since 1970. Um, in terms of looking at these, the, if the number is a little higher than the 1950 average, it's in purple. If it's a little lower, it's, it's red. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, if you look at Kansas, in some respects, um, whether or not you throw out those first 50 or first 20 years, um, into the uh, um, 1950 to 1970 period, um, there isn't a lot of difference. And in fact, if you look at other states, there isn't a lot of difference. The other thing I think that is important to realize, at least in these states, um, there's a very similarity in terms of the long-term growth uh, rates. If you look at the difference, for example, in Mississippi and in Kansas, you have 4.9% to 25% in 2022. But if you look at the long-term trends, uh, Mississippi actually outperforms by a, about a half a percent, um, both in nominal and real. And in, in some respects, um, Kansas over the last uh, period of time has outperformed. But um, when you start looking at these numbers, it's very remarkable in terms of uh, what the similarities are um, over, over time. And so uh, essentially um, we have uh, Indiana, Iowa, Idaho, Nebraska, and so some other states are around there. But um, again, looking at the similarities there, most of the rate increases in land values um, since 1950 have uh, returned between five and 7% um, from a um, real or an inflation perspective, they're kind of in that two to 3% range. Um, and so um, it is somewhat remarkable in terms of how steady they are over time. I also kind of took another point here and basically said, okay, let's just look at after the uh, 1986. And so if we uh, look at uh, 1986 forward, um, again, for Kansas numbers, it's right at 5%, 2.75%. Um, 
Probably what's most interesting here is since 1986 um, forward, um, essentially we're seeing a little less increase in nominal rates of return. Um, we're seeing a higher increase in real rates of return. And so if you kind of look at what's, what's going on there, um, certainly it's very obvious on this uh, chart here with regards to uh, um, the fact that nominal rates of growth um, since 1986 have actually um, been slower, um, but the real rates have actually been a little bit more aggressive. And um, again, you look at th this on a uh, um, um, state by state basis, really the only case that that was different is Iowa has actually seen a higher nominal nominal growth um, in addition to a higher um, real growth. And um, very few states end up having a slower um, um, in inflation adjusted growth. And so um, um, somewhat interesting that the next thing I looked at is just trying to get an indication of uh, the percentage of fall in these same 20 states. Um, Again, on this slide, basically it runs from about 11% of the time to about 24% of the time that land values will, will fall. And then you also can kind of take a look at it from a inflation adjusted perspective. Again, um, they're all kind of in this 25 to 35 uh, range with regards to that. Um, in terms of looking at this, how long do they bust out of this or how often do they bust out of this negative five to 10%? Um, for example, California, 75% of the time, it's between negative five and 10%. Um, what's somewhat interesting is Iowa, um, basically 58%. And so basically that says that 40% at the time, it's either higher than the 10% or lower than the negative 5%. And so Iowa just has a much broader range. You can see the same type of thing with regards to um, the uh, real growth. Again, most of the time, for example, in New York, 92% of the time, land values on agricultural lands on a statewide basis um, are between that negative five and, and 10%. And so again, you can end up seeing that you do get a relatively stable growth associated with that. Um, we have the same type of thing for the others and just there's a lots of numbers. And so I would encourage you just to take a look at uh, the, uh, the slides where you can look at that. But to maybe summarize, um, essentially the lowest growth rate um, over time last year was 4.9% in the 20 states studied to 25% in Kansas. Um, year by year numbers are very variable. And so in some respects, um, I'm not sure that it makes a lot of sense to get really hung up with regards to that year to year type thing. Um, things that can move these land values from year to year are kind of the liquidity available. Um, certainly uh, just the land coming up for sale, generational type things, certainly um, it is there. If you look at these 20 selected states from 1950 um, forward, essentially a very tight range in terms of the uh, average increase over that period from five um, to 68.2. Um, if you look at it from 1970, you're looking at five to 6.8. Again, a not much difference. And then from 1986, essentially you're seeing a little bit of slower growth from about 3.6 to 6.45. If we look at the inflation adjusted numbers um, for the 20 states we looked at, kind of looking at that 1.9 to 3.5%, um, 1.5 to 3.2 since 70, 1.3 to 4.19 since, uh, since 86. And so um, a lot of uh, similarity with, with regards to this. Um, agricultural land values since 1950 in each of the states are anywhere from one in 10 years to one in four years. And so there is variability and uh, um, year over year, um, it's a pretty um, steady investment. However, there are periods of time where you will see negatives and same with regards to whether or not uh, the uh, land values beat inflation. Essentially, it goes from about one in five years, um, inflation beats land values, um, to about one in three years that inflation beats land values. And so there is some difference with regards to the variability there. Um, again, in terms of long-term investment perspective, um, 
land is kind of a plotting investment. You're not going to see the low lows. You're not going to see the high highs. In terms of, again, there's a significant amount of time where land is in this negative five and 10% from a market perspective, and even more time after you take out the inflation. And so in terms of looking at this, one of the ways that uh, people can look at this is simply viewing land as a stock. And essentially, the theory that uh, kind of helps people think through this is the same as valuing common stock. Um, one of the things, in, in, in some respects, that concerns me a little bit is there is some um, discussion with regards to uh, taxing unrealized growth in stock market portfolios, certainly for the uh, um, very wealthy. Um, in terms of not that I would want this to occur, but they could use the same concepts to do this from a land perspective, um, essentially um, trying to uh, tax that unrealized growth. Um, certainly, there would be kinds of all kinds of issues, legalities in terms of whether or not that's there or not. But because of land value being essentially being priced as a stock, um, um, I, I think that is something to consider and, and certainly watch for kind of in, in, in the future um, with regards to that. Land values, again, typically is the cash rent um, divided by the capitalization rate. Um, again, Greg and Dan talked about the cash rent. Um, we'll spend some time looking at this. But if you want to compare this um, to a, a stock market type investment, um, currently the price earnings ratio, where you take the price of the stock divided by the um, earnings is 21.35. If you look at that from non-irrigated land in Kansas, and again, these are using the 2022 numbers, essentially the non-irrigated uh, numbers in Kansas were 2850. The non-irrigated cash rent is 61.5. If you take 61.5 divided by 20, 2850, you get the capitalization rate of 2.16%. In terms of essentially um, the PE ratio is just flipping that uh, capitalization rate in, in 46.3. And so um, investors in the land market are paying quite a bit higher, about twice as high per dollar of earnings in the land, non-irrigated land market um, than the, uh, the current market. Um, certainly in terms of irrigated land values, use the NAS numbers again, you're looking at 4,143. The capitalization rate is about three and a half. The PE ratio of, is 28. And so irrigated land in some respects is much closer um, to the uh, stock market. And then if you look at pasture land, and again, these are statewide numbers looking at a $21 rent, 1850 value, um, capitalization rate of 1.14 and a PE ratio of 88.1. To give you a historical perspective, the minimum um, PE ratio um, on a weekly basis uh, calculated by Robert Schiller was 5.3 in December of 1917. And the highest was 123 in May of 2009. And so essentially you um, can end up uh, seeing that uh, certainly the land values are um, there, certainly the pasture land, and the non-irrigated land are, are probably on the high side from a PE ratio. Um, in, in terms of a lot of times over history, you'll see those kind of in that 30 to 40 um, range. And, and so uh, um, the stock market is kind of in that 30 to 40 range. Um, the uh, current 21.35 that it was at the end of last week certainly is, is there. But uh, in terms of thinking about that, I think that's something to uh, look at. The numerator, um, again, we'll spend a little bit of time on that, but we're going to go over this pretty quickly simply because uh, um, Greg and Dan did a great job. Certainly market prices, government payments, yields, all are going to uh, push that uh, cash rent estimate or the numerator up. And then you have kind of costs, input prices, input quantities that are going to uh, um, push those numbers down. In terms of, uh, I think it's also good to kind of look at from a net farm income perspective. Um, I kind of like uh, plotting these numbers on the uh, um, net farm income per farm. Uh, again, in, in terms of uh, 2021, that number was over 300,000. It had increased from about 8,000 um, very dramatically. 
Um, in terms of if you would uh, ask me in terms of where to put the 2022 number, I would probably move that down to uh, um, about 150 um, is probably where that range will be. And uh, we'll see where, where that ends up with regards to once the numbers are done. But uh, Kansas certainly will be counter cyclical to what USDA forecasted for 2022. Certainly the drought had major implications with, with regards to that. Some of the early numbers coming in, um, net our insurance payments, net of cost is basically running 60 to 70% of net farm income. And, and so certainly the drought um, really um, affected Kansas last year. Um, USDA is projecting these numbers to fall from above 160 um, to uh, below uh, 140 in, uh, in 2023. Um, uh, again, if you look at Greg's numbers, uh, certainly there is an expectation that they may fall a little bit more. Um, again, one of the things I'll show some numbers here, and the big thing to take away from these next few slides is certainly just the... Uh, um, excellent financial shape um, that Kansas farms are in at the end of 2021. I don't see you'll see big changes in 2022. Um, where we are in 2023 and forward is there. But the key thing I think to take away from these next slides is just there is a lot of liquidity that can chase land and a lot of liquidity that uh, um, can pay um, for, for rents if, if that's what uh, farmers choose to do. And so um, again, in terms of the percentage of farms that uh, had negative uh, net farm income in 2021 was 4.6. I think we'll probably see that number in 2022 increase, probably a little bit more in 2023. And then essentially one in eight farms essentially lost or had net farm income less than 50,000. Uh, again, um, why I use 50,000 and that number is a little bit low is uh, trying to uh, look at um, um, issues associated with um, the ability to pay far family living. Um, certainly the average family living is probably in that 75,000 to 80,000 range in that. The other thing is, is that a third of the farms roughly had positive income each of these years. And so even when incomes were low, um, it's a very dichotomous sector. And, and again, this can end up uh, raising pockets. The debt to asset ratio, again, um, fell quite a bit um, in 2021, um, really in a good place there. Um, this next one basically, I think, shows or indicates just the amount of liquidity there. Um, essentially, the thing to draw away from this is at the end of 2021, there was a lot of liquidity. And uh, in some respects, I think that probably affected the 2022 land values. And I think we'll probably see some of that affecting 2023 land values once they come out. And so even with the drought, the amount of liquidity that was built up on um, balance sheets um, is, is pretty high. The next is the capital repayment capacity in terms of just trying to take a look at, okay, do they have enough cash coming in to pay their principal interest taxes and everything else? One of the things you'll end up seeing is that blue line is 100%. That basically indicates that they can cash flow um, principal and interest um, on their farming operations. One of the things you'll see is there's a lot of years and the preponderance of the years is that um, it's not gonna cash flow but to indicate how unusual 2020 was in 2021 were essentially you have substantial um, liquidity in the sector. Essentially in 2021, farms were able to have twice as much um, cash on hand um, to, uh, to pay um, their principal and interest in, in other expenses. And so again, while debt per acre is moving up, the ability to repay um, we're entering um, 2022 and 2023. Um, certainly the 2022 numbers, I don't think are gonna move a lot from uh, 2021, but if we go into a downturn, um, certainly there is some liquidity on, on the farms. Again, in terms of this, just summarizes this. The, the key thing is, is farms were in an excellent financial condition going into 2022. And this is also going to extend into 2023. 
Um, in, in terms of uh, um, certainly even with the drought, the uh, the crop insurance, I think, is going to be a major c contributor um, to uh, um, really helping um, Kansas farmers uh, essentially be in a situation um, to uh, um, um, be in 2023. In terms of looking a little bit forward there, in, in terms of uh, essentially the blue line is the secondary access, which is soybean price. Then the yellow is corn, the uh, um, dark blue is sorghum, the red is wheat. One of the things I think that's important to realize is that prices um, have trailed off um, since the uh, um, advent of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Um, in terms of wheat prices, or uh, corn prices, wheat prices, and sorghum prices, and in some respects all kind of recovered into that October-November um, timeframe. And since then, they've essentially slid down. Soybeans have probably held a little bit better than uh, than than the other. And again, these are uh, cash prices um, for um, soybeans, corn, sorghum, and wheat in uh, um, Salina, Kansas, um, on a on a weekly weekly basis. If we look at what the numbers were this morning in terms of in Salina, um, basically you're looking at a cash bid of 70, 780 for wheat, 670 for corn, 660 for sorghum, 1439 for soybeans. Forward pricing, the 2023 crop, um, again, we're looking at a 772. And so there still are um, um, opportunities out there for pricing wheat. If we look at corn, sorghum, and soybeans, essentially there's quite a bit of dropout kind of where that forward bid is in 2023 with regards to the cash bid. And so for the new crop, we're looking at about 130 under, um, 140 under for sorghum and uh, $2 under um, with, with regards to that. And so uh, um, certainly that's out there. Um, in terms of uh, cost of nitrogen, um, I have two slides there. One was where it was uh, February 1st, 2022, and then where we were um, at the close of last week. You can see, for example, that fertilizer prices have dropped. If you look at anhydrous urea, um, UAN um, 28 and 32, um, and so there has been some relief there. Likely though, a lot of producers probably priced in some of that fertilizer um, early and uh, um, probably wishing that they wouldn't have maybe priced in as much as as, as they did. Um, hindsight is always 2020, but uh, um, certainly some of the prices are kind of getting down um, where they were kind of in February 12 and in, in, in February um, um, 2013. In terms of using these numbers, kind of with some 2020 estimated total expenses and kind of the current prices, and then I used a five-year crop yield. Um, Greg is already indicating from a wheat perspective, 50 probably may be high. We may be looking at 36, and so you'd want to look at those numbers. But just at this point in time, using average yields over a five-year history, um, kind of prices, yields, and expenses are looking at uh, um, a 73 um, net income um, per acre for corn, 95 for sorghum, um, 145 for soybeans um, on a wheat perspective, 51. One of the things you may end up seeing is you may see a few more beans um, planted with regards to uh, um, just where that price is relative uh, to, to the others. And so it will be interesting to see based on moisture conditions and, and other things as we progress into the spring, whether or not uh, um, there will be a shift in acreage um, to, uh, to uh, soybeans. Um, again, this kind of summarizes the numerator perspective. Um, and uh, a sense, in some respects, the 2023 prospects have weakened. It'll be interesting to see just kind of where the uh, Russian conflict, um, Ukraine-Russia conflict or war is. Um, essentially, early estimates from the uh, fall wheat planting perspective in Ukraine is that about two thirds of the acreage was planted from normal. And so with that, uh, um, certainly um, there, there could be um, things to, uh, to look at. We'll finish up with the denominator here, looking at interest rates, inflation, and expected growth in cash rents. 
Um, a lot of this um, will will be interesting, and there's just a lot of uncertainty and um, kind of with some of the issues going on in the banking sector, some of the things the Fed is meeting today and I haven't seen yet in terms of what they have ended up uh, looking at. But um, uh, essentially, um, looking at this, one of the things that I kind of follow a little bit is the University of Michigan inflation expectations. These are kind of a year out in terms of inflation. Um, they have the mean and the median. Um, in, in some respects, one of the things you've seen is a little bit of a difference, more than normal, between the mean and median. And so while um, the medium is kind of the midpoint of the estimates, there are um, quite a few participants in that that think that inflation is going to be higher than, than kind of the 50% uh, um, individual with, with regards to that. And so you can see that this is skewed towards higher in inflation es estimations. Um, it will be interesting to see once these numbers are updated, but um, um, we have seen in January that this has uh, fell below six and uh, has fallen below four um, from the, uh, the median. And so um, uh, essentially you can see that we're quite a bit lower than what the highest numbers were. Both were in uh, January, 1980. Um, but again, we're still relatively high from a recent history um, in terms of the median. Um, previously, the last time it was above four was in May of 2021. And so we've had um, several months of uh, the median of being above four. Um, several months of the mean being above 6%. And, and again, um, the last time that occurred was in July 2008. Um, interest rates are really in play in terms of uh, over the last um, year and a half, and these are daily um, T-bill, T-bond rates. Um, several interesting things going on there. Um, we've seen a rapid increase in rates in terms of uh, essentially in October 21, kind of one year rates on T-bills were uh, pretty close to zero. That had increased very steadily up to uh, 5%. You can see that the last few days that's dropped. Um, and then you have uh, the uh, um, five year T-bonds and 10 year T-bonds. These are longer term rates. Couple things knowing here is we essentially have flipped um, these these rates. And so we have an inverted yield curve. Um, essentially, the short-term rates, the one-year rates are higher than the five-year rates, which are higher than the 10-year rates. This is a non-normal situation. Um, normally, um, that's kind of uh, where, um, where we are. And so typically, you're going to end up seeing these things where the shorter rates end up being, being lower. And, and so... Uh, um, that is uh, um, one of the things that um, is is out there and kind of leads us in terms of uncertainty. There's a subset of economists that uh, believe that an inverted yield curve um, is a sign of a recession. And uh, um, I guess we may end up testing that with regards to, uh, to where we are, but uh, we have been inverted here um, on the uh, five and 10 year rates, um, probably um, for about a year. And then if we look at uh, the, the one year rates, uh, we saw some in inversion kind of um, beginning in uh, last summer. And so um, again, um, I need to fill in the XXXs there. I just kind of saw that in terms of, but essentially the, the one, the five and the 10 year um, T-bond rates are higher, and they're quite a bit higher than they have been over a longer term um, perspective. The next slide here is I'm going to uh, look at the real interest rates. Um, this is referred to as Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. The way to interpret this is this is the return that you get from holding these bonds above inflation. And so these are indexed to inflation. And so looking at this right now, you're looking at a return above inflation of about 1.4%, both on five-year money and 10-year money. Um, what's interesting is we had a long period of time um, from uh, April 2020 all the way into um, about uh, April of the year ago 
where we ended up having a negative real rate of interest. And so savers were willing to uh, take a negative rate of return above inflation um, in, in order to have that, uh, that security. Um, again, these numbers of 1.5%, roughly where we've been the, the last few months, um, are kind of, if we compare this, typically these rates have been running from 2 to 3%. And so in some respects, this is moving more back to a normal situation than being relatively high. Um, in some respects, the fact that there is a rate of return above the rate of inflation for these is, is probably a good thing from a saver perspective. Um, and uh, obviously, from a borrower perspective, um, it is in increasing the real cost of, uh, of money. And so looking at this, um, essentially, um, before 2008, these rates were in the 2000 or 2 to 3 percent rate. Um, currently, they're in that one to three to one to four point. And essentially, it's been a very major paradigm shift since 2021. And so essentially, we had 13 years where essentially we had um, um, very low real cost of, of, of money. This here um, is looking at the inflation rate. One of the things you'll end up seeing on this is we also see a little bit of a decline in the inflation rates. Um, they've, um, on five-year money, they've uh, decreased from about 3.5 to about 2.5 um, in terms of the 10-year money has went from about three to about uh, 2%. Um, in, in some respects, you're seeing a closing of those uh, rates or inflation rates. And so we're getting down to, uh, at least from, five-year and 10-year estimation of inflation rates that are market determined, um, we're kind of getting down to that 2% with regards to that. And there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in the short-term and the longer-term um, rates. And so again, um, since April 2022, the inflation rates have backed off a bit. Um, again, inflation rates are in the 2 to 2.5% 2 for five and 10-year money. Um, again, um, five-year and 10-year inflation rates flipped in uh, January 14th, 2021, and they've remained flipped towards that, although we are settling back kind of to that 2.5 in those uh, inflation expectations, at least uh, from a market perspective, are fairly level. The last thing is looking at um, farm credit acquisition rates. This is the uh, um, interest rate that uh, farm credit um, purchases their money on Wall Street in terms of the interest rate they're paying. In terms of uh, the uh, purple line is one year, the five year is green, the 10 year is red, and uh, 30 year is light blue. Um, again, one of the things you've seen is over the last couple of years, it's uh, quite a bit higher in terms of uh, essentially the 30-year uh, rates are kind of, and the one-year rates, the one and 30-year rates are kind of in that 5% range. The uh, um, five and 10-year rates are kind of in that 4% uh, um, range. And so you have seen quite a bit. This goes back a little bit further, again, to illustrate that uh, um in, in some respects, at least on um, the 30-year rates, we're kind of more in a range kind of in uh, 2011, 2012. We're quite a bit higher on uh, where we were on uh, the uh, five and 10-year rates and substantially higher on, uh, on the one-year rates. And so, um, again, you've seen that run up in short-term rates with regards to that. The last thing I do is uh, calculate these uh, spreads. Um, these spreads, basically, I take the farm credit rate minus the uh, T-bill rate for the same bond. And so I subtract the 30 from the 30, the 10 from the 10. Um, one of the things you'll end up seeing is on a one-year perspective that uh, premium was very close to zero. And so there wasn't a much difference between um, lending to farmers or lending to the U.S. government. Um, you do see that... Uh, that has increased from about zero to about uh, 0.2 or 0.3 percent on one-year money. Um, you've also seen a little bit of run-up 
um, on 10 year money and 30 year money, the five year money is uh, has not moved a lot. And so in some respects, there are bidding in a little bit more risk premium um, for lending to farmers than uh, has been there. Um, but again, it's it's not outside the uh, the normal range. I, again, a lot of times um, you're, you're going to see that 30 year rate being about 1% above the 30 year T-bill rate. Um, about 0.6%, um, maybe that's a little bit higher. And then if you look at the green numbers, that's uh, fairly in line with a fairly large history. And so um, certainly there is a lot of movement in terms of what's what's going on. Um, but overall, um, while it wasn't quite as good a picture as it was, um, the investors view lending to the US government and US farmers is very close um, to equal risk for the next five years. Um, the 10 and 30 year spread has increased, but it has dropped. And so it'll be interesting to see where that is. And essentially the one year spread has increased to about where the 10 year spread is. And, and again, that's very unusual um, to, uh, um, to, uh, to see that. In terms of looking forward, um, probably the big thing is in, in terms of as investors are beginning to look at uh, in investments into land or into treasury bill rates, um, you kind of can go back to look at that uh, um, capitalization rate on um, land um, and uh, um, kind of look back in terms of uh, um, where that acquisition rate is and you do have to add some on there. But uh, in terms of treasuries and, and, and comparing that because the rates have increased, um, there may be pressure in terms of increasing those rates of return on uh, farmland, at least from a cash perspective. Um, investors may be less willing to uh, um, bid up land prices um, simply because they may end up wanting to move that. Um, the the uh, um, inflation-adjusted return um, has, uh, has increased a little bit more to normal. And, and so it will be interesting to see whether or not that cash rent um, land value um, change, um, whether that narrows a little bit with regards to a, seeing a decrease in the price, the earnings, earnings spread. Um, Greg and Dan talked about the issue of uh, um, certainly um, cash rents are much more related to cash flow and the profitability there. And uh, essentially, um, farmers need to choose in terms of how much they end up paying for land. Um, again, I think we're probably going to see um, a lessening of increases um, into 2023, um, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that um, the uh, um, issues are, are such that uh, we're going to see a, a decrease in, in land values. Again, I think there's a lot of liquidity out there and uh, in that. And so the income picture, while it isn't great like it was, um, it's, it's probably good over the next couple of years, in terms of even um, in a situation where we're looking at maybe 40 to 50,000 at this point of the year um, with regards to uh, um, net farm income, um, that is not outside of the, the normal range. And, and so uh, I think if we take a, a um, kind of a period um, back and, and kind of look at where some of those net farm incomes were, um, it may be heading back to more um, normal rates, um, we may see kind of that capitalization rate begin to be pressured upwards. Um, with that, um, I will uh, um, kind of look at the questions. Um, in terms of uh, the Fed raised a quarter point today, um, um, I appreciate that in terms of, uh, um, certainly I hadn't had a chance to, to look at that. Um, um, Terry odds that banks are probably going to have a difficult time. Um, I think certainly um, there will be segments of, of banks that, that have a difficult time. Um, in some respects, I think a lot of it's going to occur or depend on whether or not we head into a re uh, recession. Um, from a food perspective, um, again, um, I'm probably less concerned about those banks and financial institutions that lend to producers. I think uh, um, we're still in a good situation, um, but um, 
um, if you were looking at some of the things that are more subject to recession, um, those may end up being the banks that are in a more difficult uh, time. Um, a question here from uh, Dan. Um, I guess that's an answer. Um, uh, we will talk about kind of the investment non-resident uh, investment sales in the Flint Hills and in Kansas and in other states um, two weeks from today. And so kind of stay tuned for that. Chuck? Um, James has a good question there with regards to the slide in corn and wheat prices. In, in some respects, um, I don't disagree with your sentiment there um, in terms of, um, um, I, I think, in, in we've heard from Antonina um, kind of on the Russian-Ukraine conflict, but I think what we're going to see in Ukraine is the, uh, the damage is cumulative. And so I think the 2023 prospects, at least in the Ukraine um, um, production, are probably going to, uh, to be negative. And whether or not the rest of the world can make up that production and whether or not that can uh, um, look at there, uh, it, it, it's going to be interesting in, in terms of, um, I, I do think perhaps one of the things that we need to think about is that the damage that was done to uh, um, institutions uh, last year um, has not been fixed in terms of uh, uh, elevators that have been bombed or uh, tractors or combines that have been uh, um, um, moved across uh, lines in, in terms of that eastern portion of Ukraine um, that um, is... Uh, um, in kind of conflict, it's 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 not really clear, and in, in I haven't seen anything from either the Ukrainian side or the Russian side in terms of what the estimate of how much of that acreage, if any of it, got uh, planted. And so I think it is important to realize that a lot of the Russia Ukrainian that eastern part where the fighting is going on is the main wheat belt, and and, and so. Uh, um, less so from a corn perspective, but but even then in terms of whether or not they're gonna put fertilizer on, whether or not they're gonna put uh, other uh, um, 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 inputs on will be interesting. One, if they're available, and then two, um, I think it's pretty important to realize that a lot of those farmers in Ukraine probably have not been paid for a while. And uh, uh, so liquidity is is going to be there. Um, in terms of uh, James is indicating we do tax unrealized growth, certainly from a property, property tax perspective, um, that is the case. But uh, if it ever moved to an income tax um, space, that um, certainly would, would be interesting. Um, certainly those growth rates, um, somebody indicated that, um, and that is correct, you got to take a little bit in terms of what the actual dollar amount is. A 5% on a lower acreage base is going to be less than 5% um, uh, on higher um, priced. And, and so certainly that's there. But um, it, it is kind of interesting. And in, when I looked at that, I assumed I would see a lot more um, rate differentials on that cumulative growth rate over time. Um, kind of thinking of some of the urban influences in Florida and Texas and um, New York. And uh, um, probably one of the things that surprised me the most um, when I started calculating those numbers, and I guess I have about um, 30 states to go, not quite, because I don't think they have that in terms of uh, um, um, Arizona and Hawaii, but um, I was surprised at how tight those things were. Um, you see different variability in different states, but um, essentially, um, um, I don't think we can just uh, just look at that um, in, in in that and kind of think, well, Kansas is different than Iowa is different than um, California. Um, those things move a lot closer than than maybe I thought. Somebody indicated that uh, if the Fed increased today, does that further the increase in the yield curve? It, it certainly could. 
in terms of um, they'll probably push shorter term rates up a little bit more. Um, and uh, what we've seen so far with the tightening of the money is we see more movement in the one-year money than we do the five, the 10, and 30, which makes sense from an economist's perspective in terms of if you're only going to um, put that in one or two years, um, it's not going to move a five or a 10 or a 30-year um, rate um, up as, as much. And, and so um, you are seeing that the, essentially the markets still think we'll get to a longer term normality in five, 10, and, and 30 years. And, and certainly I hope the markets are correct. 